Okay, so I, I think we could um, start little by little. Um, I'm uh, Professor Huhtamo from uh, Design Media Arts here at UCLA. I would like to welcome you to uh, this event. So we uh, have a guest uh, tonight from um, uh, San Francisco, uh, artist uh, Bernie Lobel. And um, uh, so uh, Bernie uh, is actually uh, showing um, his work um, right at the moment at the Art Center College of Design. Actually, it's a big, a big exhibition there. So many, many installations, and uh, actually, I think quite a few of the works that Bernie is going to talk be talking talking about as well um, uh, are, are shown in that that exhibition. So if you get interested, and I, I'm sure you will, so it would be a, probably an interesting idea for you to go and try these pieces yourself, because uh, that's a situation we face when we talk about interactive art uh, far too often that um, we see documentations of this, but we, we have no chances of exp exper experiencing those pieces ourselves. So, so that's, that's also like a special opportunity. So I uh, personally got to know Bernie Lobel's art uh, something like maybe 10 years ago. Or, or so, and uh, um, went to his um, studio in San Francisco and was very amazed by all the things I saw, not just the um, structures that Bernie kept on testing, actually, also in his apartment, you know, and, but also so like the, his, his library of, of many interesting looking obscure books about the history of technology, science, all kinds of things, plus uh, interesting objects, things like that. So I it felt like visiting a, sort of like a cabinet of curiosities or a physics cabinet of a savant from the 18th century or 19th century. And then um, uh, probably uh, the works by uh, a certain scientist from the 19th century uh, uh, had a sort of like very special place, and that this uh, scientist was Etienne Jules uh, Marais, a French physiologist, um, uh, scientist, m medical doctor, uh, who's also remembered as one of the sort of like founding fathers of the idea about the cinema, the culture of moving images, and through that also media arts. I'm sure we will hear about Marais. Uh, in connection with Bernie's art a little bit little bit later. Um, so what makes uh, Bernie's uh, kind of work very special is that unlike many other artists doing works with media, communications, and uh, interactivity these days, Bernie builds his things from mostly wood, wooden structures and pneumatic uh, elements. Even though I'm, I, I know he could quite as well use digital technology. But it is an artistic choice, and I think it's a particularly interesting one. Uh, and um, Bernie has been developing this particular kind of aesthetics for, shall we say, about a quarter of a century. And uh, I think the achievements uh, speak for themselves. Quite amazing things that uh, you will be uh, able to uh, experience uh, tonight. and. Uh, Please uh, uh, think about questions to ask after after Bernice um, uh, has has gone through his presentation. For for with these words, help me welcome Bernie Lubell. So um, yeah, so um, the ideology of innocence. This is the well, yeah, I remember the microphone. Yes. <laughs> I'm gonna be moving around. Well, well. What? I, yeah, maybe I, maybe I use that. Yeah, thanks. So, um, you know, uh, you know, th th this talk really is a, is a, um, a, is kind of a detailed description of this one particular piece and how it came about, and um, and uh, you know, and it's this piece is not looking exactly like this, but this piece is out at the art center. It's um, it's a heart simulation that. Uh, that is inspired and uh, in, in some ways actually stolen from Etienne Jules Marais. And um, 
you know, uh, you know, in essence, this, you know, this this piece is about. Um, I don't know which way am I going. There's a switch on this. Yeah, okay. In in essence, this piece is really um, about you know this whole question of uh, you know of uh, us as machines. Are we machines? What kind of machines are we? You know how. Um, you know, how does this work, this idea of a mechanical model? And then, you know, in the, by the 19th century, which was when Marais was working so much, this, uh, this mechanical model had achieved quite a bit of success. The idea of the human motor had become, uh, you know, really quite fashionable. And the biggest problem at that time was really the problem of fatigue. You know, why do people get tired? The machines will go on and work forever. So. Um, you know, and this this idea of fatigue, this problem of fatigue, was actually kind of also connected to the um, the the problem of entropy. Why do things get more disorganized over time? Um, you know, and why you know uh, why does energy get less useful? So uh, you know, these problems were you know it's funny because at the end of the 20th century, the problem of chaos was kind of creeping in. The idea of chaos theory was very big. And at the end of the 19th century, the problem of entropy was really big. Yeah, I, I think of them both as kind of the same problem. It's the, the problem of the fact that we can't really control everything we'd like to. And, um, you know, so uh, in this spirit, I'd like to present um, the outline for this talk tonight. Um, <laughs> and this is, you know, this is, I mean, this is, I actually didn't do this outline just before this particular talk, but I did do this. This is the outline of the talk, the first time I gave it, The Ideology of Innocence. This is one I had. DVDs and slide trays and all sorts of crap to deal with. Um, so um, before I want to show you any of my art, I actually want to talk a little bit about the words in the title. You know, the uh, etiology these days is, the etiology means, uh, you know, is the study of causes. And it's really pretty much only used by the medical profession now, at least it, as I, you know, it's the etiology of a brain tumor. The, you know, where does it come from? Um, so, you know, uh, it's the origins of a disease. And this connection to medicine is actually pretty, um, quite pregnant, if you will. It's, um, and the idea that disease and, and, and uh, innocence are somehow also connected, I think, is, uh, is, is, is intentional for me. Um, you know, innocence is either usually shunned as unsophisticated or it's blindly embraced, but I don't think it needs to be this way. You know, it's, um, the possibilities for innocence, I think, are much more profound. And looking back from the end of the machine age to an earlier, more innocent time, you know, when it seemed that simple mechanical models it might explain everything, uh, and experts were generalists, and truths seemed to be just around the corner, this is, um, you know, this seemed to me to be, you know, like a perfect moment, you know, the moment that Marais was in fact working in, in the 1860s to the early 1900s. You know, so you know, this idea of the truth, though, um, you know, could be simple. It, it never seems to work out that way in practice, you know. So anytime you, you know, you actually get honest with yourself about how well your idea, you know, like matches the world, you wind up, you know, adding little things and little fixits and little mechanisms and little add-ons and, you know, so you have to start by being, you know, um, an idealist and think that everything's going to be simple, but you wind up with this complexity and uh, there's kind of a, there's a, a Murphy's Law calendar I said that, you know, I saw once that uh, kind of sums this up. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, what is it? It says, um, you know, wisdom comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. So I think that this, you know, there's a kind of a little paradox in this that I think is kind of sums up the way I work and what I find appealing about, you know, Marais' work and about, you know, well, about most endeavors, really, you know. Uh, and the question for me is how do we keep this sense of wonder in, you know, when we're, we're as we get more sophisticated, how do we maintain a sense of wonder and, and surprise and this, um, you know, this, you know, th this sort of thing. So, the origin of my ideology of innocence comes out of Marais' work. Um, Marais is most famous for photographs like this. Um, he called chronophotography, uh, and for some of his film strip cameras that he made, because you know his life's work was about inventing various ways to record and understand motion. And um, you know, here's here's a, a few more. Um, 
You know, the, and these photographs, I think, have in a way altered our sense of time. You know, I think in, people have argued, and I think it's true, that before this sort of work, you know, you would think of the past and the present and the future as having sort of equal weight, that there was a certain kind of s substance to each of them. And, and when, if you look at this photograph, there is, there is no past, there is no future, there is only now, and you can't hold on to it. And this is a you know, very modern conception of, uh, of time that I think Murray is in part responsible for. Murray is also well known for having made these fabulous cameras of one sort or another. This is one of his uh, fusil photographique, you know, which I, for a while I thought that, you know, that, that, you know, that the idea of shooting a picture came from um, Marais' fusil photographique, his gun cameras, but no, it, I don't know where it comes from. Um, this one would shoot you know, about 12 images on a single glass plate and um, make images something like this, because at that point his film emulsions were pretty crude. So he's shooting birds <laughs> in flight, and, uh, and he would get like a, you know, like a whole collection of them in different positions, trying to understand how it is that birds were flying. So, um, you know, so he was, Murray was, was trained as a physiologist, but he was really an engineer of life. And um, this next thing, which I think I have to hit the volume, this is one of his more famous, this is high speed, motion picture cameras, which, which is incredibly modern. This is as soon as Kodak had invented film strips, Murray was using them in a camera with, with this, the, the slit, the slit cylinder is like is, is still was still being used in high eight, I mean in uh, um, eight millimeter cameras, and these are these are some of the you know the very first questions he tried to examine. How does a cat turn over when you drop it? You know. And so this is one of the very er earliest movies you know um, on record. So, but before Murray was doing film work, he was doing these pneumatic studies of motion. Um, so, um, and, and this I found more interesting to me. So here he's got a horse hooked up, uh, you know, so he's got, you know, pneumatic sensors on each of the four hooves of the horse, and the guy is carrying a, a, a smoke glass cylinder that's being rotated by a clockwork, and, you know, the, you know so, you know, um, the idea that you could ride this thing and get an accurate record of anything is amazing, but, you know, um, but nevertheless, he apparently did. So. You know, so, so Murray's bent was to understand mechanically what was going on, that was happen things that were happening too fast for us to see, like a horse in motion, or too slow for us to see, or too deep inside of us um, to be apparent. Um, so, uh, you know, here's an image of one of the sensors, this one on the foreleg of the horse, not on the hoof itself, to, you know, as the muscle contracts, you know, it would change the pressure in this little pneumatic sensor. This is the kind of record he would get of a horse's motion, you know, uh, you know, uh, indicating the, um, you know, the, the length of time that each hoof was on the ground, and the distance and time between each of the of the those moments. So um, this is probably sounding a little familiar to you because, um, you know, uh, shortly after Marais was producing this that body of pneumatic work, um, and probably as a direct result of it. You know, Moybridge, Edward Moybridge, um, made these famous series of photographs of the horse in motion, where you can see where I've got the arrow, the, the horses, all four of the horse's hooves leaving the ground at a full gallop. And this is, um, you know, the way I hear the story is that Leland Stanford saw Marais' work and commissioned Moybridge to, um, to prove photographically that, that in fact all four of the horse's hooves would leave the ground at a full gallop. And, um, and, and the wonderful, nice circularity of this is that as soon as Marais saw Moybridge's photographs, he said, I've got to get into photography. This is amazing. So, and then Marais did these photographs that I showed you earlier, um, which, um, which is completely different. Um, so Moybridge had a completely different legacy than Marais. This is, I mean, I p picked a, a particularly prurient kind of Moybridge image, but you know, he was very interested in these like, like you know, slightly, mildly sexy, you know, or actually at the time, this was probably wildly, you know, sensual, and, um, you know, uh, slightly naughty images that, that have a kind of a story built into them. 
Um, you know, uh, Marais' images are, are completely unlike that. Here's another. Marais' images were kind of deadpan scientific analyses of the motion itself. You can see that, that Moybridge was not interested in, um, he was more interested in completing a story than in a scientific analysis because you can see that, you know, uh, in, in those two uh, images that I have uh, an arrow on, you can see that he was taking, he took the first image and because one of his cameras failed, he took the first image and put it in as the third image. But, you, but if she's dropping the handkerchief, you know, it would be lower, not higher in the third frame than in the second frame. So, um, uh, you know, Moybridge was using multiple cameras um, to shoot his images. And in Moybridge's images, the past, the present, and the future all have a kind of an equal weight, unlike the Marais images where um, it's really transformed. And this is another Moybridge kind of image. This is a stage photograph, actually. The, no motion was involved at all. The woman was, was suspended there about to spank the child. But the interesting thing about this is, I think, is that you, you know, this is, you know, feeds contemporary motion pictures in a lot of ways. He's got three cameras, essentially, three views, which is kind of the classic Hollywood thing. And, uh, and he's got you know, a tracking shot built into this an implicit tracking shot built into the way that you're moving around the subject in, with all three cameras. So um, anyway, back to Marais. Another one of Marais' amazing innovations was, uh, I hope you're not going to get, I'll get to my work. Believe me, I, I, this, but, we, but, I, you know, but I'm just you know, so in love with this guy you know, and what he's done that I just have to go on a little bit longer. So one of Marais' amazing ideas was to uh, dress people in black, put dots on their joints and, uh, d and lines on their, um, on their limbs and photograph them in motion, which you know, looks, of course, a lot like contemporary stop motion animation that people are doing. They're doing the exact same technique that Murray was doing in the 1870s. Um, here's another uh, image, you know, and then he takes the image and makes a, a drawing of it to get a better sense. And this might look familiar to you in some ways because this, these images had a direct impact on uh, Marcel Duchamp, who took that that very same image and basically, um, you know, and it, and the curious thing is that Marais Marais thought he was making he actually one of his intents was to was to create better art, make art better by by allowing artists to see in detail how the motion of a figure was working out. And the irony of it is that the most important art that came directly out of Marais' work were things like Duchamp's nude descending a staircase, which are not about accurate portrayal of realistic motion. It's about you know, our sense of time and space, which Marais was totally ignorant that he was altering for us. So, um, but you know, back to the pneumatic stuff. <laughs> because this is the stuff of greatest interest to me. This is a Marais apparatus to analyze how the lips are moving when you're speaking. You know, so you put your lips over those two loops and your breath is going into this tube and they're all connected to his pneumatic sensing apparatus. Um, this is the kind of pneumatic charts that he would make, you know, with a, a tambour, he called them, a little drum with a piece of rubber uh, over the, the top as a drum head. And then this one actually has an endless roll of paper that is being drawn on by a stylus. Um, here he's got, um, you know, uh, a runner hooked up with a pneumatic shoe <laughs> so that he can keep track of the runner's motion. But what he's really interested in in this particular device is the position of the head of the runner as he's running. With each footfall, what is the head doing? <laughs> so he's got a, a sensor on the guy's head as well. Um, here he's got a bird hooked up to, um, to uh, trying to understand the nature of flight by the way the bird's wings are moving um, in two planes, forward, backward, up and down. And uh, obviously this bird would only fly for a short time before it would tear the wires right out of the uh, equipment. So Marais had to invent this cradle that the bird could fly endlessly around in circles on. You can, I, I, yeah, I shouldn't have brightened that image. But anyway, you know, it's going uh, around in circles and up on top you can see it's a, a harness that, uh, so that the bird doesn't have to carry the apparatus anymore. And these are, on the right are some of the charts that he would get as a result. And interestingly enough, uh, 
you know, of course, you know, we're talking about what is this, 18, what does that say, 1870? The, you know, the, um, no one knew how birds flew. They still don't really know how birds fly. But, um, uh, but, but it's, um, but, but there was a big question at the time when people were trying to make man flight possible. You know, I mean, you know, can you make, can you fly, use flapping wings, or this idea of lift, a fixed wing, can you, can you actually get some, this phenomenon of lift, you know, to, uh, to actually get you in the air? And, and it was not clear what, what the answer was, whether you were pushing the air down or whether there was this lift occurring. And um, Murray's experiments demonstrated that the bird flew based on lift, uh, you know, th that it actually rose on the forward stroke, not on the downstroke of the wings. And, um, you know, so uh, the Wright brothers, among others, were reading Marais' work. Um, now we're getting closer to the stuff that is of greater interest to me, and that's Marais' physiological apparatus. This is a, a sphygmometer, a pulse meter. And this is literally with a glass slide reading, you know, your pulse from your, your, your arm there as you're, um, you know, uh, as you're wearing this, this device. Um, and this is the piece, the, the engraving that's central to the, the installation that I've done. It's um, a device to simulate normal and abnormal heart rhythms. So um, I came across this by, by accident at, at the, uh, uh, this image, by accident at the Minneapolis, uh, the Bakken Museum in Minneapolis. And a year later, I had to have a heart operation. So I, I actually had a, needed an aneurysm repair. Um, but not uh, not a fun thing. This is my echocardiogram, but which is which is in, um, from that time, and you can see you see the blues and the reds are all occurring at the same moment coming out of my aortic valve. It's not supposed to be like that. You're supposed to have all blue, then all red, all blue, and then all red because the blue and the red are the color coding for which direction the blood is flowing, and the valve should be closing and stopping it. You know, so it's going one way, then it's going the other way, one way, then the other way. With me, it's leaking. That's my aortic valve, actually. Pretty good, pretty good picture of it. Um, and um, there was some great sound on this, but it seems to have disappeared. You know, this is Doppler imaging, you know. And, and this, of course, which is the thing, I, the reason I've got this up here is, is you know, is that um, aside from reminding myself that I survived that, was... <laughs> Was that um, you know you, you know uh, this is this kind of imagery is the direct descendant of Marais' work because you know his work was you know instrumental in medical imaging and especially in cardiovascular uh, work. So um, this now we get to the experiments I was doing for a few years trying to get this piece together and now I want audio back again, which is. <laughs> So, um, so there's a little worm here, and I make my own little chart recorder here. Not so little, it's actually about five foot diameter disc. That, that was a car, not my machine. But here I am with my mechanism drawing directly on the wood. And at this point, I was calling it, I was thinking of this as a device to analyze your attitude because, because what the pen traced out was dependent on how you were leaning on a stool. So if you're leaning backwards, it's pushing these pneumatic devices one way, and if you're leaning forward, it's pushing them another way. And this stool wound up with a completely different purpose, uh, ultimately, but at this point, I was using it to analyze attitude. Okay, pedal now. And then, yeah, someone on the bike to make the disc turn. And, uh, you know, my basic, you know, toothpick uh, would, you know, uh, 17 jewel movement. And this, yeah, this is so. I always get carried away with these things. So this disc is a big disc of wood, so it's got a lot of warp in it. So the disc is waving in and out. So I've got this mechanism that, that charts how much the disc is waving. 
you know, how, how much work there is. You know, it's kind of, it's riding on top of my too loud, not loud. Thanks. So anyway, these are just experiments. I was thinking about Marais' apparatus and these uh, devices. So I just hooked, you know, some tambours together to kind of release balls. Which another, neither that device nor this one have I done anything with. This is, you know, you know, 10 years later, I still haven't, you know. But then, nice the way they bounce off the little drum there. For a while, I had a sensor hooked up to the drum, too. And then the other key to making any work of art for me is to have too much junk around. So these are like organs I cast, um, you know, many of which found their way into the piece, but many of which wound up, you know, in a box, that, you know, because they, that's a used aorta. You don't want to mess with those. Um, it's not going to hold anymore. Um, so uh, this is a yam. I cast this uh, over a yam. That's an eggplant. So it's important to eat your fruits and vegetables. I think that was just a balloon, not very exotic. Those prickly things were chiote plants that I used to make those uh, work. Is another chiote. So at this point, I'm kind of floundering, you know. Uh, I, I don't really know exactly what I'm doing, except I know I want to make... That's a big gourd that has an aneurysm. <laughs> it's got this swollen part at the top. You know, a friend of mine, when I found that, he said, you know, uh, and then after I had this surgery, he said, you know, you should have thrown that away years ago, like I told you. Because it's the, the magic of keeping that, that gourd, you know, has probably um, caused your aneurysm. So if, if you've been to my show, or if you go to my show, you'll, you'll see some of these parts wound up in pieces, but not every one of them. Oh, just a little poignant little piece. I think that one rotted. So. Um, so now, I don't know if you rec remember the Marais uh, board, you know, with the organs on it, you know, but now I've, I've kind of trying to recreate his engraving here and trying to figure out how to get this to work. worked up to a point because that string wound up cutting its way right through the uh, the organ there. But then I switched yams and ventricles and um, wound up with a slightly more sophisticated version. But so, um, you know, so there's this question, you know, I mean, I don't know. Maybe a lot of you have had this similar experience, but you know, a, a lot of artists will make will make pieces that are about things that are happening in their lives, and this was clearly, in a way, about my my heart situation. So people were saying, well, maybe you're trying to regain some kind of control by making this art piece, and you know, um, some kind of control over a failing body. But but you know, but my idea of control is 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 kind of more like 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 things like this. You know, I mean, I, I feel like if I do a diagram like this, I've got control over something. But in fact, I, I, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like a cobbled together thing that that just barely gets me through. That's my idea of like supreme control. So, um, you know, so I, and and in fact, I often start art pieces with words, you know, uh, with charts like this. Um, but I have a kind of a suspicion about words. I kind of feel that words are like. Um, or a little bit like magic incantations, you know, and I and I'm a little distrustful, um, you know. Uh, so this 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 actually flowchart 
you know, um, this is a little questionnaire piece that I have. This is in the show, actually, at the Art Center. And um, it's a question that asks you to trace your, your idea of heaven by going from word to word on this chart. And um, it's an aphasiogram. Well, you'll see why it's an aphasiogram. Um, because as you, as you answer the questions, you know, you kind of go from word to word and tracing a route from one word to the next till you get to your idea of heaven. But you can see this isn't a free pencil. This pencil is actually hooked up to these pneumatic sending units, which are transmitting, uh, you know, like a pneumatic pulses to another room where they're drawing your root out, but there are no words left. It's just stripped the words away, hence the aphasia. And, you know, as you might have gathered, this is my idea of heaven is that kind of childlike state, you know, of being in wonder. Um, you know, so words and symbols are, in a way, often too direct for me, but I've got them all over my pieces. And, um, in fact, uh, you know, I have this, I kind of have this ambivalence about magic. And, 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 and in the installation at... Uh, at uh, the Art Center, there's three boxes like this, one short squat one like this and two taller ones, just in case I have this. And if you open the case, you'll see there's this out of order sign. I keep it handy because I figure, you know, if I have this sign there, if something breaks, I'm ready to put it on the, the piece. And that means that, you know, the power is the be, even though I don't believe in them. They know that I'm ready, so they're not gonna mess with my piece. You know, because I'm ready, you know. So, I mean, so what good is it going to do them? They're not going to get any real gratification out of it, you know. So it's kind of a little bit of voodoo that I'm working here. Just having this box there is keeping the piece from breaking, I think. But, you know, and it's actually, there's a Niels Bohr story that's, um, that relates to this that, that's, that's pretty funny. Uh, one of the creators of quantum mechanics, um, you know, apparently he kept a horseshoe over the door to his office. And his colleagues would say, Niels, you know, you're a scientist. You don't believe in this horseshoe magic stuff. And he said, oh, no, of course I don't believe it. But, you know, they say it works whether you believe it or not. <laughs> so that's kind of my attitude. You know, I think, well, I don't believe it, but, you know, <laughs> I'm kind of protecting myself. So anyway, here finally is a full installation of the piece as it ultimately turned out. Um, so when you crank this, you're pumping air, as you know from the other images. But now I've got a belt hooked up to it. It's become much more elaborate. A belt with loose ends tied on and several chambers to this heart going from room to room. And I've added other contraptions here. So this particular device that that loose end is heading for is, is the heartbeat mechanism. So when you stick your head in it, and interestingly enough, this is not a, you know, this is kind of like the privileged position where you lay your head on someone's chest to listen to the heart. You might also hear this on the in. But in fact, this, is, this device is there to provide the right back pressure so that this other device, which I'm panning over to now, this, I think of it as a lung in this jar, can throb effectively. It needs just the right amount of back pressure, the right level of liquid, but it needs a leak. And my, my favorite part of this is as it dies, I think that's, and it kind of crinkles up. So I'm too high. <laughs> um, so one thing you might have noticed about this piece, you might not have, is that, um, is that it, it takes two people to get an ex this experience of the piece because the cranking is done outside the rooms where all the results occur. And, uh, 
I kind of like that gesture, and I used it a few times. And I like the idea that it takes two people to work a heart piece. It seems kind of appropriate in, in a way. Um, let's see. Now, this, I, I just threw this in at the last minute because I thought, oh, I've got longer to talk, so I can add another piece that I might throw in. So I don't have a perfect segue for the, this. But you know, this, is, this is a piece that kind of addresses the way my, my work is designed. You know, that a lot of stuff comes out of accidents and things that I hadn't intended. And yet, you know, it's, it's sort of as though, um, as though I discover what I'm doing as I'm doing it, rather than um, than having a plan that I'm following through on. So this is a piece called the Archaeology of Intention, which is about digging up what I was doing, right, and why. So uh, and also a little joke about Michel Foucault and the Archaeology of Knowledge and you know all of his deconstruction work. Um, so. Um, this is the this is the conceit of the piece this this drawing. So on the top layer, you know, of you know, the top part of this drawing, you would maybe have a cross section of the earth as you might find these sticks and stones and things. And if you were to excavate them and separate them out, and let's just for the moment imagine that we actually are living in a peat bog here, so that their fibrous material might actually be preserved. And you've got these these notched sticks, these shaped stones, this fibrous material. Well, the standard reconstruction for this is um, a, a stone hand axe that you would see on the right. But there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't build a digital computer out of the same materials. And that's what I proceeded to do. I made this little mock archaeology on this site here. Um, you know, and, uh, and then created these digital computer components. You can see they're all labeled. You know, there's the not, the and, there's two ands, a not and an or. You can see the or in the middle there. And, and this, the rotunda of the capital of the city there too, which is nice. Um, and it's great when you know, some of these sticks and arrows were actually about, about 27 feet tall, the tallest one. So when the wind came up, it was really pretty spectacular having not waving and, you know, and so on. Um, and in the lower right-hand corner, because I was kind of interested in this idea of, of, of all I, I didn't know, I don't know anything about archaeology. Everything I know about archaeology is looking at the pic pictures in books. And pictures in books have labels and arrows, and they have little charts in the lower right-hand corner. So I kind of recreated this all physically. Um, you know, so this chart kind of explains how the, uh, how the hand axe evolved into the digital computer. And um, you know, uh, through goddess figurines, and uh, and how it ultimately pushed the goddess figurine off into another universe. Um, so this is another another view of the site. You can see the uh, you know the various components, the and also these cutaway walls. You know that would cut away because you know there was a obviously. There was a period where there was a post-computer literate culture living in this area, so we had to get down below that era to reconstruct the, the digital computer equipment that they were using. And um, you know, so you know, the discovery of this site is is the idea of a Stone Age digital computer. And, you know, and um, you know, could it work? What would working mean for this? Um, so I've got it, it's actually a small multiplex device. It. Um, it, um, as Erky was saying, I am at home with the digital universe. <laughs> Not really, but um, this is the one anachronism. I have this giant wheel. I figured that there were priests in this subterranean chamber, and depending on how much money you gave them, they would rotate the wheel to determine which group of supplicants at the two and gates would get the, an appropriate response. So um, this is the uh, this is the knot, the inverter, and this actually works in a kind of a Kind of a simple way. I mean, I show this to kind of illustrate it. You know, if you pull on on the string on the left, it feeds rope out the right. So you're taking tension and converting it into uh, into slackness. You know, so you're going from a from a plus uh, you know, to a minus, a one to a zero, whatever, however you want to interpret it. So it's um you know, it's a knot. It's an inverter. Um, this is one of the AND gates. You can see on the front of the AND gate is the analog to digital converter. Because when you pull on the rope, you don't want to just pull continuously. You want to pull, you know, in a way that it goes from one stop to another stop. You know, uh, 
Here's a, a close-up of the, uh, of the uh, analog to digital components there. Um, this is a hole in the ground because you know, I was digging all these pseudo-archaeological areas, and uh, when I put a hole in the ground, I would find that people would just stand there and stare into the hole for like 10 or 15 minutes. And I, I did throw some things in there, but, I, you know, but it, it wasn't necessary. There was something about a hole in the ground that just, you know, people would, I put a screen over it so people wouldn't fall in by accident because it was about six feet deep, you could hurt yourself. And, but, you know, but that, it was interesting. Anyway, so the, um, the outcome of all of this, the two AND gates and the, uh, and the, in, and the inverter and, and such was, was to, um, uh, initially, was, uh, was that this little device here that's half buried in the foreground, and that was to, you know, it was to swing clappers. And originally I had a stone, I had a, uh, a concrete bell that I made <laughs> that was that the clappers were hitting the bell. And, you know, as my friend, um, my friend, we're standing there listening to this, and it's kind of making this sound like thunk, 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 you know, and... And my friend turns to me and she says, um, you know, Bernie, this does not have that ontological sound. And uh, so I replaced the bell with this, <laughs> which actually does have that ontological sound, I think. You know, it, uh, it kind of gets to this whole question of, you know, of the search for meaning and understanding. So, um, and it, you know, it kind of, it's an end that isn't an end. You know, we've got a kind of a narrative here with this piece. It kind of goes from one end to the other, but this is an end that isn't an end because, you know, further study is required. So of course, you know, I'm getting like, I'm building this stuff. I'm getting totally into reading about archeology. span So this is a, um, this is a recreation. I don't know if you know about this book is now pretty old uh, by Maria Gimbutas, the, the gods and goddesses of old Europe. Pretty fascinating book. Well. Um, you know, here is a, an impregnable goddess. You know, frequently, you know, they would, you know, there's all this idea of trying to use gods and goddesses to create, um, you know, more fertility for the for the planting. So the little holes that are forming kind of a necklace at the top of this goddess, you know, those are, well, not this one because this was recreated in concrete, but the original one was, um, you know, they would put rice or some kind of grain in there, and of course the grain would rot away, but they would, you know, put a necklace of grain around the goddess, and they would put these, these stones in as, as though they were fertilizing the ground, as though they were putting seeds into the, into the goddess to have her give birth to um, more crops. And these were my, another gesture, archaeological gesture, my sieves of significance, you know, which had, I, I made hundreds of goddess figurines and computer pulleys and things. The whole site was littered with them, and they're still there. You know, it's been plowed over, but they're still there. Um, this is the diagram of how the computer worked, you know, um, which, you know, if we, if people are interested, we can get into this in more detail later. Um, but I thought you like to know that, you know, that it actually did work. It took a lot of people tugging on the ropes because a huge amount of friction. So, um, you know, it took about six or eight people at each station to get things to happen. And the video didn't come out, so no video of that. So, okay, so back to the etiology <laughs> piece, you know, where, um, you know, the, well, I kind of did half of this because I interjected it. Um, but you know, but 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 everything in my pieces is really pretty fragile, you know, and 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 yet it's working. It's kind of like just I like to get my pieces so they're just barely working. It gives them a kind of a human quality, I think, you know, something that's more like, you know, you wouldn't take a, a parakeet and and slam it around unless you were, you know. Well, anyway, forget that. I mean, people might do that, but you know, we but you know, you treat something alive, you know, with some delicacy because you know you you know that it'll respond to what you're doing, but you know you don't want to abuse it. And so I, ha I like to have my pieces in this same kind of way, this uh, this some kind of you know tenuous kind of quality to them, but also a kind of a tenacious quality that they will kind of hang in there. And it's kind of the way my ideas get me through life. You know, they're kind of tenuous and tenacious at the same time. So, um, but you know, so okay, so this, but this talk, God, I've spent more time than I thought I would. We're gonna have to go faster. <laughs> uh, this talk is the ideology of innocence, not and innocence. And it, you know, and, 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 and what I'm bringing up here is where do new ideas come from? And uh, the next piece I'm gonna show you is kind of, is kind of addressing that, 
you know, if, if everything has a cause, how can anything have a beginning? So this is a part of a piece called The Second Story, A Twice Failed Tale, which is about breathing life into, um, into uh, through 100 feet of leaky pipes. We're going to cut to the video a little faster here. And um, this piece is not at the Art Center. I've got most of the parts for this still. That says applied desire here. If you... And these are kind of crude wood bellows, that, uh, wooden canvas bellows, that are pumping air through about 100 feet of leaky pipes. And this piece, that's a gauge of aspiration. It's, you, know, you can see it's hard, it doesn't stay up very long. Um, this is what's happening on the other side of the wall. I gotta pause this for a second. This is, I, I edited this video. It's going way too fast for me to talk over it. But you know, this piece um, was the occasion of one of my greatest discoveries because what happened was um, I had there was a wall between uh, in in the gallery that they wouldn't take down, and and they didn't have enough money, and I didn't have enough money, so the wall stayed up. And um, and I had originally done this piece all in one room. But I thought, okay, so I'm going to separate the causes and the effects, and we'll see we'll see how that goes. Um, uh, you know, people will kind of deconstruct it and reconstruct it in their minds. Um, but anyway, back to the whoops, oh, wrong button. Back. Oh no, now we got to. Do I know how to fast forward? I don't. Well, anyone know how to fast forward in Kina? Oh well. Okay. I do what? I turn my hand around? Oh, this, here you go. Right, thanks. Yeah. Is this faster? So I think we were about there anyway. So, um, you know, one of the, one of the things I, I've always had this literary bent, and I discovered that uh, a friend of mine found this quote from the book of Ezekiel, you know, about Ezekiel trying to breathe life into the dry bones. And I, you know, I've always wanted to have a, a, a biblical, um, you know, a little biblical quote to start off one of my pieces. This is a roll of paper that I was looking at. So does this not go off? Or? I thought if I moved the cursor, it would go off. There you go. Okay. A roll of paper I was working out uh, ideas for the piece. And these are what I call my purloined principles, which are basically ideas I've stolen from other people. That, you know, that reality is fundamentally derivative. You know, they, how, there can't be anything new. You know, there is no success like failure, Bob Dylan. Failure is no success at all. Um, you know, the question that was arising was, well, if, if um, you know, how can you understand understanding if you have to use understanding to understand it? This is my little bit of revenge. I put a hole in the wall and a little window in it, you know, because they wouldn't take the wall down. Um, so, um, my first discovery of the of the amazing power of out of order signs. So I, um, I had them here for the first time in this piece. One of my great discoveries. But you can see now we're on the effects, the effects side of the wall. So you pump these bellows up and you, everything springs into life, but only kind of briefly. But, uh, but the way this thing whimpers when it dies, isn't that kind of lifelike? I mean, you know. Anyway, lots of mechanisms in this. This is only a smattering of what's there. So you're looking back. Now we're going to turn around and look back at the, uh, at, the, at the two rooms. So this is what happened, which was really amazing was that people didn't like deconstruct this and reconstruct it in their mind. No, people found other people. They said, hey, I can't see what this is doing. Would you watch, watch it while I do it and then I'll do it while you watch it? And I said, oh, interesting. And this actually is an answer to how anything new comes about. This is the answer to the riddle of the origin of life. You know, is that if you're in a closed logical system, every cause, you know, has a cause before it that you can define all of them. 
But if you've, you know, let's see, this is the next one. Um, okay, so, you know, but if you're, but if you're in a, uh, the slides are a little sharper. This was, that was high eight, you know, which deteriorates rapidly. And uh, anyway, um, if, you know, but, but if you have multiple systems, like multiple people interacting to create something, you've got, you can have something completely new, something that didn't exist in either of their closed world views. So, you know, and this is, it turns out, if I'd read further in my uh, research, I would have discovered that Lynn Margulis, uh, the biologist, had already proposed this idea of cooperative systems creating life rather than, than a single, you know, progenitor. And so, you know, I, I show you this slide of, uh, the standard evolutionary view, you know, this is a legacy of monotheism, you know, like the one God kind of creates everything. The one common ancestor will create all these different kinds of bacteria. This turns out not to, um, not to actually reflect the way bacteria have evolved very well. Um, this reflects it much better. You can see even at the base, it was not simple. At the beginning, it was never simple. You know, there was never one primary cause. And, um, you know, and this whole notion of cross-fertilization that's occurring even as far back as you want to look, you know, so I think, um, I think this is, this seems to fit, you know, like my way of looking at things, obviously, you know, it resembles one of my charts. This is a chart for another talk that I did. This is the outline for a t talk about touch. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I think maybe we'll, we'll skip my big discussion of touch, you know, about the, but, you know, but there is this kind of interesting contrast between touch and vision, you know, vision, and I owe some of this to a book by um, uh, Gabriel Josie Pavici, a book called Touch, which is, you know, um, anyway, it's a very smarmy book, but, you know, but, but he's got some good ideas if you can bear with, with his tone, his, you know, his incessant quoting of ancient Greek without translating it and things like that. But um, he, uh, you know, I mean, he suggests that, you know, that, that vision is kind of free and in a sense promiscuous in a way. I mean, he doesn't use that word, I, I do. But you can look around a room, you can look across the horizon, you know, instantly you can change your glance and see all these different things. But if you're going to touch something, you have to get up, you have to go over to it, you have to touch it. You know, you've made a commitment of time in a sense and other things. In a sense, you know, um, you know that's what, what this is about, is uh, touch puts you back into a world of time, you know, you know, whereas vision can take you out of the world of time. You know, you, you think of artworks as being timeless, you know, in museums. But, you know, um, one of the things about interactive artworks is that they exist in time, you know. This is a piece I'm going to show you that is about time. Um, and I think um, i got a video of this here. Um, you know, about time being kind of, uh, actually, I think, uh, you know, time is kind of a curious thing, uh, you know, of course, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, so time is both discrete and continuous at the same time. We measure time by watches, which are little event machines. We think of, you know, births, deaths, weddings, you know, uh, funerals, you know, whatever, you know dinner later, I'm thinking of that right now. Um, and the, um, you know, so we, we kind of set, get a sense of time by these events, and yet, you know, you know, you go to sleep, there are no events that you're aware of occurring, and yet, you know, you wake up and you're definitely older than you were before. Um, so, you know, th this idea of life being something that happens when you're busy doing something else, the John Lennon line. Anyway, what better place to contemplate time than from a rocking chair, I think, you know, because you know, when you're a child, perhaps you're in a rocking chair in your mother's arms, and then as you get older, you, um, you know, and much older, you're on the back porch in the rocking chair, hopefully, you know, smoking some weed with your buddies or something, I don't know. Um, but, um, so this, you know, I've got some, an analog of time here, I've got this, this ratchet mechanism as you're rocking the chair, it's, it's causing time to move forward only in one direction. And what's happening here is you're very slowly winding up the string that's on the left there. So that after about a month of people rocking in the chair, there will be enough tension in the string to actually cause something to occur, cause a breakage to occur you know, all the way across the room. We're about to pan across this. Sometimes I do it in two different rooms. This piece is not, it's not here. It was almost here. But, the, but when you go to the show, you'll see there's not enough room for everything.
hands were steadier. Yeah, I could do this freehand. <laughs> I cannot do that because the cameras are too small now. Anyway, you know, we aren't any mass. So there's this kind of wood sculpture. Now I've actually got this speeded up here so that a month is being compressed into a few seconds. Well, I've added this to let you know that that's um, happening. What's actually happening is I'm uh, in, the, in the videos. I'm yelling to Lenny and saying, "Okay, Lenny, pull the cord now." So he's comp what's happening is that these parts are being pulled together and they're compressing. And something will break. There, something broke. But it won't be as dramatic as this. It's one of those wonderful moments that you miss. You know, uh, you know, the important stuff happens out of sight. <laughs> in a way, and this uh, is another one of those moments um, that it would occur occur like that, you know, where you would uh, where, where the, you would be working to get this breakage to occur, and yet it would occur, and you would miss it, um, and it would only happen once. So, um, so okay. So my pieces are are about you know participation. They're about being physical with with the work, and. Um, and uh, and they require cooperation and manipulation, and um, I like people to be part of them. You know, to be participating within the piece. You know, rather than observing something from outside. So this next installation, which this is a clip of, is here at. It's called the Conservation of Intimacy, and this this piece kind of extends Murray's endeavor of pneumatically analyzing things to try and understand um, a little bit more about analyzing intimacy. So the way the couple is moving on the bench, you know, is being reflected by the motion of this, this tray, which is moving balls that you can watch on a video monitor in front of you. And also, you know, moving pens that are uh, kind of marking, marking your motions on the chart that's coming down the wall. Um, yeah, so the, the idea of the title is kind of the idea that, you know, that you know, intimacy might be something if there were laws of, of social, the social world, like there are laws of the physical world, well, this is if the people on the bench are moving side to side, they blow in the ear of the person on the on the bike who's making the paper come down. Just to kind of make a little menage à trois, so you know it, it um, you know it, it really is about intimacy. And um, so you know, so if there are laws of the social realm, like there are laws of the physical realm, so we've got conservation of matter. Conservation of energy, you can't create or destroy it. You can only transform it in some way. I'm thinking if this social world has laws like that, maybe intimacy would be fundamental. You can't you can you can transform it, but you can't make it or destroy it. Anyway, it's a little romantic thought. I like to slip in there once in a while. Intimacy must be conserved. So, and this next piece now, I'm going to pause for a second. This is a piece I did with Paul De Marinas, who is uh, an absolutely amazing artist. This work does not reflect much of what he's doing at the moment, or although there's a part of this which you'll see. That, but um, but I urge you all to find out more about about him and um, and what he does. Uh, but this is a piece, you know, a lot of my um, this is a participation that I that that Paul and I created that was about kind of participating in a primal event. Whoops, oh no. That, well, at least we haven't started the damn thing yet. And <laughs> so, um, another high ed video. This one we edited in the camera. So Paul, Paul made these, um, is that still loud enough for you guys? Paul made these amazing chaotic jump ropes, if you will, but in this case, they're chaotic handrails. A little bit more, okay. handrails on the staircase and uh, when we were playing with them you know we were thinking about for reasons that are too complex to explain we were thinking about a rainstorm so upstairs we created a kind of a analog of that there's a digital rocking chair you know. um, and here's the rain so the pedal, lightning thunder rain Flash attack to lightning, two metal thunder. And we have a little feedback mechanism. I mean, the way Paul's has the. Yeah. 
Is that good? Is that, is that going to be too soft? Eric, you just told me to turn it up. <laughs> anyway, there's the, there's the sheet metal thunder. And uh, there's the rain on the, on the tin roof. Maybe we need a little more. Did you see the rain yeah. um, And what was really nice about this is that um, when you stop pedaling, so I stop pedaling now, and it's still dripping a little bit. It's kind of like the end of a rainstorm, but it's still dripping. So I put a bucket out to catch the drips. And in fact, it caught some of the little pieces of string that fell off the roof because it kept coming untied. Um, so this is a, like a, this is a Marais style photograph. This is, I, you know, it was a very dark room. I had an 18 second exposure. That's me in all three positions. You don't see me running between them, but you see me you know, working each part of the piece. Um, and this is a piece that um, is another kind of primal theatrical almost event. And this one is at the Art Center. Um, it's called Sufficient Latitude. And it's a piece about being lost on the ocean at night. So, um, you know, one person riding this bike makes waves uh, uh, in this sheet of black plastic. Three little balls out there to keep you company on the vast dark sea. Of course, you know, a required, you know, a flow chart, you know, to, so you understand what you're doing and why. And if, if you do understand it as a result of the flow chart, I would feel like I failed completely. But, um, so another person is making the boat rock and roll. And the boat, you know, when you row the boat, you make lights glow on the horizon of the ocean, like you're making landfall at night. You see the lights there up in the, up in the upper right-hand corner there glowing? But it's hard work rowing, and you know the lights flicker and they go out, and and you stay lost forever. You never get home. So because So the next piece that's at the Art Center that I can talk about some here is, um, is a piece, I, you know, um, I started speaking of Marais and life, Marais studying life. This is kind of a piece about death. And uh, in fact, it is a piece about death, except that it's got a light touch. It's, um, uh, you know, I was at an artist residency and I was making these, these kind of tin can telephones with these wood horns. And at the same time, you know, I was thinking of these things as kind of a model of the brain, you know, a network of these tin cans and these springs and interconnected, you know, kind of, you know, communication device, kind of like the brain. And uh, at, that, at that time, my mother back, this was in North Carolina, my mother was in Orange County and she, her health was failing. She was kind of heading towards the end there. And I was speaking to her over the phone a lot and, uh, and, and, and I couldn't understand her so well, which was, kind of just like these phones that I was making. You couldn't understand people who were talking over these things very well. And I was thinking, you know, as I'm talking to my mother, I was thinking you know, the telephone is kind of like magic, really. We've forgotten, we take them totally for granted, but you don't really, you don't, you're not, you don't have a real sense of the other person on the other side as being really there. They could be anywhere. You know, in fact, my mother, who I knew was dying, could be dead. I could be speaking to her from beyond the grave. Um, you know, well, anyway, I was thinking of these thoughts. Um, so, um, you know, so I, I actually went, you know, back to see my mom at the point, you know, bef you know, um, closer to her death and was with her when she died. And as, as she was, um, you know, as she was dying, we were using the telephone again because we were talking to all um, her relatives, trying to communicate with them. They were getting old. They couldn't fly out. We were trying to communicate. My mother was still incomprehensible. I'm doing this kind of translation. And, um, you know, uh, so I was kind of fascinated with this, this moment when consciousness ends, you know. In, uh, you know I, and in a way, it was also hearkening back to, I, by then I'd had another piece of heart surgery. So I'm thinking about, 
you know, about when I was going unconscious for the anesthesia and my mother is dying, and the last, her last breath, I'm thinking about this. I decided, you know, I had to add a coffin to this installation somehow. There had to be something that connected a coffin to the piece. And, um, and I decided to build this coffin and make it so that people could communicate to those outside of the coffin through tin can telephones, which, you know, I kind of like because I, I used to play with them as a kid. But meanwhile, I, I took a little trip to, um, I took a little trip to Europe and uh, we, one of the places we visited was, um, was this in, uh, in Bologna, this is uh, San, Santo Stefano. And, um, and I started to realize that the church is really kind of maybe an early form of installation art. You know, that you, you would go there you know, like you would go to an art exhibit, you know, a, sort of a pilgrimage, if you will. And, um, you know, you're bringing your own memories and your own history to this, and yet there's the memories and the history of all the people who have been there before you in this place. Um, you know, this is a particularly uh, strange little church. It's, uh, it's claimed to fame is that it's the most exact replica of, um, of, the, uh, of, the, of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem that exists in the world today because this was built in the 10th century as a replica of the Holy Sepulchre and the one in Jerusalem had been, has been modified much more recently than that many times. So this is a more faithful reproduction of that such as it is. So, um, but a very claustrophobic little space, very vertical with a, with a dome. You know, this is um, looking from the, the 7th century church to the 10th century church. There's other interesting issues about this church because it was kind of the site of, uh, the, the, you know, when I first walked up to it, I said, you know, there was a spring here. And I, you could just see it. There was, there was a source of water here. You could see this was a holy site before there was God, you know, that because this was a place where everyone could get something to drink and so you had to agree not to kill each other at that moment, you know. Um, so looking up at the dome and the, um, and, um, you know, so you go to this church, you know, there's a saint behind those bars. You know, there's a saint in there. Um, the saint, the, the patron saint of Bologna. I can't remember his name now. And, um, and you know, you get there, to, you've come there to see the saint or his relics, but you can't see them. You're separated from this. There's something about this, you know, the architects essentially have contrived to, um, to create this, this, this extra distance we can't traverse, which is kind of an interesting thing because it's, it's a reminder that in death, you know, um, it, you know th there's no amount of pilgrimage, there's nothing you can do, no amount of devotion that will allow you to traverse that distance of death. You know, that separates the saint from you irrevocably. And, uh, and, and it's also a reminder that there are truths that we cannot ever grasp. Um, there are things that we can imagine but we can't ever really know. So, um, so my the title of my piece, this is the coffin part of my piece, that's me going into the coffin there. Um, you know, uh, it's entitled, the, and the synapse sweetly singing, which is, which is kind of a, a, my version of this, um, of the, um, of, uh, of a, a cream song from the 19, around 1970. You know, um, where the tales of brave Ulysses, how his naked ears were tortured by the sirens sweetly singing. And, and actually, maybe at the end, I'll tell you a siren story, a very interesting little siren song story. But here's the, the installation. Now, this installation in, in a modified version is at the art center. This one needs a little more volume. So you get to crank yourself into the coffin. It's actually very pleasant. When you, if you go to the show, if you haven't been yet, you know, you really quite enjoy being inside. The glowing knots in the pine, you know, the sound of these kind of, you know, reverberating drips. I'm here. Hello? Is there anyone there? Hello? Who's in there? Hello? system to feed back like this, where you get this kind of vibrating sound. The new version, for some reason, is a higher pitch vibrating sound. 
Who knows? I don't understand it exactly. But, uh, oh yeah, there's... This is there. Yeah, anyway, there, you know, it's, it's a fun feedback-oriented kind of uh, trip along the uh, path to death. Is there anyone there? But unlike regular death, you can actually come back out. You can just turn the handle the other way, and resurrection, also a part of the religious iconography. So I'll tell you this, this quickly, this little uh, siren song story. You know, I, uh, I don't know if you guys know Margaret Atwood, the author. I heard her on the radio once. I don't know whether this was a poem, whether this was her just being fabulous on the spur of the moment or what. But, you know, I, I tuned in at the moment where she's saying, I know the siren song. I know what the siren song is. I know that song which will make men leap to their certain death in fiery seas. And that song is, help me. Please help me. Only you can help me. And I don't know if, if you guys have been in enough relationships, but I can tell you, you know, that this is what guys and, and women do all the time. The women are, are, are working that siren song, and the guys are leaping into fiery seas to help them, whatever it takes. Um, anyway, uh, I thought that was, that was fun. Um, uh, I think we're going to skip this piece. This piece is at the show. I'm going to show you th this video because this is kind of um, this is a, a piece I'm taking touch and breath and kind of mixing them together. And uh, it's a breathing machine titled The Little Breathing Room. And this is sort of my latest piece. It's not really fully operational yet. I haven't gotten it to work consistently. But as you pedal the bike, you work this blower, and the blower pumps air into the, between these two sheets of latex. But there's an automatic, but totally mechanical breathing apparatus connected to that. So as it inflates, I, I, I added an organ pipe because I had all this air. You know, so I made a good organ pipe. Here's the mechanism that opens the valve and dumps the air. So when it, this is working well, it's really quite amazing, but, but I haven't gotten it consistent. It, it, I think I almost got another heart attack trying riding the bike, trying to get this video shot. But art will do this to me. But I love the way, you know, when you're looking at this from the other side, how the figure will reappear as the, the two latex sheets get closer together again. So, um, so you know, this is a, another piece that's at the show at the Art Center, but uh, I'll talk about that in a sec. But, uh, you know, there's something about touch, you know, which one of the things about touch is that it, it you know, we, we, we talk about touch, and, um, and, and I think that there's a certain element of truth in touch, you know. And in fact, the very the idea of a touchstone is kind of related to this. So... Um, you know, the, the ancient, you know, a particular stone, I don't know what it was exactly, but if you rub gold on it, it would leave a streak that was, I can't remember, black, I think, or something, or gold. But, you know, if you rubbed a piece of brass or bronze that looked like gold on it, it would leave a green streak. So the touchstone was the, the, the um, you know, the device that allowed you to separate the, the true from the false. And... Um, and I think that, you know, there's something about our bodies, you know, that, that does this in a way for us, whether we uh, think about it consciously or not, that, you know, that um, 
Uh, but anyway, so you know, so anyway, enough of this serious stuff. This is, um, you know, um, you know, this is a piece that allows you to test your own boundaries in kind of interesting ways. And so, with my apologies to both Irving Berlin and Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, I, I give you, um, you know, cheek to cheek. We're gonna, I'm not going to talk, so we'll up the volume. So you, you put the headset on, you sit on the, the stool, and you start to move around. So your lower cheeks are pumping air into these membranes that are against your upper cheeks. So you get to dance with yourself cheek to cheek. And that this kind of Mona Lisa smile, it's, it's virtually inevitable. It's, it's, um, I tried to get into it. Now. <laughs> That's the audio. I, I just have a lavalier mic on my uh, on my. Uh, that's what you hear. Yeah, just a little touch of safe sex, and you know, fully clothed. So um, uh, that was all I was going to show you. I mean, there's more I could dig up if you want, but I thought maybe we'd have time for some questions and feedback and things and and whatever. So, thank you, Bernie. Yeah. So. Okay. okay, so I, I think we up. saw examples of uh, some quite extraordinary artworks and, uh, and also got the sort of like uh, very uh, interesting uh, idea about how, how such a sort of like art can uh, sort of like develop through this kind of a, like a very long process. So I would actually like to open this for any questions uh, you, you might want to ask uh, Bernie about his art or say his uh, world view or whatever. Yes, okay, uh, Gil. Well, um, just curious, wanted to see the, the documentation you had for the pieces in, in Pasadena as well, if that's well, possible. You skipped one of them? You skipped one of them? <laughs> skip, I did skip one. Yeah, we can go back to that. You want to see yeah, that? I'd like to see that. that. It's a very short little video. It's, um, okay, so let's see. So we'll, we'll look at that. And um, there, are, there are more videos, but I don't have them in. Uh, let's see, is this the one? Yeah, okay. So this is called making a point of inflection. Well, I mean, this, this is kind of a mathematical term, a point of inflection. That's when a curve changes direction. It's the second derivative. It's about you know, um, uh, it's about you know, acceleration, changes of acceleration. So um, you know, this piece though has very little to do with that. <laughs> it's mostly about relationships. You know, if you pump up a relationship sufficiently, which is what I'm doing here. You know, you get this air bubble you can kind of press against, but there's always something between you and the other person. And it's very transitory, but you know, no matter how close you try to get, there's something there. I've seen people get into some pretty powerful sexual experiences at this piece. <laughs> Another piece, you know, it's interesting, latex and safe sex, you know, they kind of go together. <laughs> um, anyway, so that's um, the making a point of inflection, just a short little video. And I don't think there's anything else I've skipped here. So if, we, if you want to see more, there are more pieces, but it's going to require digging them out of QuickTime files. 
Maybe this is enough, enough, enough burning for one night. Okay. So, uh, any? Um, do you have any other questions uh, you want to ask? Or let, let let me bring you the the microphone. Um, you know, in one corner of your exhibition, there was that little stand where you can take the survey. I was just wondering if you're going to use that information to produce another work, or if you could divulge what you're going to make. I, I've been meaning to do this. Yeah, because otherwise there's no record, right? Yeah, it doesn't go anywhere. This is kind of nice. I like the idea that my voice dies here. It, it ends in this room, doesn't go anywhere else. But, um, uh, you know, I've thought about that for years, and I did analyze some of that that data for a while, just informally myself. The first time I did the show, I, um, I with, with that piece, actually that, that little questionnaire stand goes with the rocking chair piece, because it's about time. Um, but the rocking chair piece is not here, just the questionnaire stand. But when I looked at the, um, at the data, one of the interesting things I found was uh, that, um, uh, I'm trying to remember, there, were, there was not an appreciable difference between men and women. Um, younger people definitely, you know, had, um, you know, uh, felt that the, the future had more time than the past did. <laughs> and older people, which is pretty obvious, it makes sense. My favorite part of the questionnaire, though, is the last question, which is, you know, did you use a pencil with an eraser? And I, you know, now half of the pencils in the box had erasers and half of them did not. And you chose one, presumably at random, but Dr. Freud has told us that none of the things we do are truly accidental. That there are deep psychological meaning to everything we do, including the choice of pencil we picked. So, you know, so I, I figured this was my way of doing a full personality inventory with one question. Because if you chose a pencil with an eraser, you were definitely insecure. But if you chose one without an eraser, you were not. So I had this correlation to a personality inventory, um, you know, along with your zip code and some other important pieces of information, which should allow me to be able to sell you a new iPod. But, <laughs> but um, anyway, now I, I, you know, the, the, the short answer is, uh, I've been meaning to do it, but I can't find, I have not found a good way to, um, to scan this data in, and enter it into some computer so that I could do this work without taking a hideous amount of time. I mean, I just tabulated people's stuff by hand on a big, excuse me, on a big chart on a wall. And, um, you know, uh, when I did it the first time, I could now enter it onto a spreadsheet, but nevertheless, you know, it still would be piece of paper by piece of paper, but, you know, um, but if, I have enough volunteers who would like to do data entry, which is a job that you know doesn't get you know the accolades it deserves. That would be good, you know. <laughs> I could, you know, we could do that. So yeah, but no, I I, I meant to you know do that, and then also the other questionnaire, the heaven questionnaire, um, you know, is also has some uh, interesting roots that people take, and uh, and interesting words that they wind up on, you know, which I also have not analyzed. But, but the, uh, it's implicit. The analysis is implicit in the piece. We don't need to actually do it. <laughs> anyway, Sorry, yeah. Even, um, I, had a, I sort of had a sneak look at other people's data entries, and I made some comparisons. And I realized that you could definitely tell how pessimistic or optimistic someone is. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of interesting. And yeah, and I think, I think that would come through in yeah, the Yeah, it made me decide to become a more cheerful person. So. I think that was definitely a strong mm -hmm. fact on an obvious. There, there are drugs for this, though. You know, we <laughs> we can take to become more cheerful people. You know, we don't actually need to, you know, work on psychology anymore. <laughs> uh, Bernie, given that a lot of your machines have sort of a certain amount of direction to how people are supposed to interact with them, like sit here and pedal, uh, what is the um, what's the most unexpected interaction you've seen someone uh, have with one of your machines? Well, um, well, I, I, don't, I don't put directions on the pieces. I rarely put directions on the pieces. So people have to figure out how to use them on their own. And um, which is not that hard because they, you know, it's sort of obvious. You sit on this, you pedal that, you know, you crank this, you, those sort of things. Um, I'm trying to think what, um, in radio, they call that vamp until ready. 
but you know, I've run out of vamp and I'm still not ready. Um, I'm trying to, you know, I, you know. Well, in fact, that last piece that uh, that Gil had me uh, show, you know, was uh, that whole piece came out of interactions I wasn't expecting. I had no idea what I was going to do with that piece. I had these du this double latex wall, and I and I just pumped some. I, I decided, well, okay, well, I need to pump air into it. You know, I don't know. I'll do that. And then I wanted to, you know, and then I put it out in a show, and I had no idea people were going to. We're going to like press their bodies into it and start playing with it like that. It just had, hadn't occurred to me. I didn't know what I was going to do with it. So th that actually gave the piece its title. It kind of made the piece have meaning. You know, so in that sense, that was, I don't know if unexpected, but that was certainly fortuitous. Um, it was unexpected in the sense that I didn't know what the hell I was doing until people were playing with it. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. There, there might be a better example. And some, at 3 a.m., give me your cell phone number. At 3 a.m., I'll give you a call because it'll occur to me what the, what the perfect answer is. You know? It's sort of like, you know, God, I wish I had said that to her at the time. You know? But you know, now it's too late. But no, I, I can't, I, I'm not thinking of anything else at the moment. But maybe something will occur in the middle of some other answer or something. But, uh, it's 510. No. Um, so this idea of auto-destructive machines is really interesting. Do you draw a distinction between um, being mentally prepared for a breakdown and versus like designing your machines to break down? Because some are designed to destruct and some are just, you know, you talked about this idea of like being prepared for the breakdown. And yeah, I'm not really designing them the to. Other? I'm not designing them to break. What I, the, you know, it's it's an interesting thing because there are a lot of people, you know, like Mark Pauline, for example, you know, survival research, you know, they're designing machines that'll destroy each other or destroy them, you know, and tingly just machines that'll destroy themselves, and uh, um, and I find this fascinating. But I like I like to be um, I like the idea of uh, machines that are just hanging in there, you know, that are you know, so I so that are, they're just they're they're right. So they're so close to the line of not working that you're thinking about their failure all the time. But they're not failing. They're continuing to work, in spite of the fact that they're right on that edge. Because mainly because you know what the the people say: everything you do is a self-portrait. You know, so this is kind of my self-portrait. You know, this is what I think of myself. I'm just like right on the edge all the time. It's about everything's about to go he to hell. And um, yet, you know, I'm hanging in there. And, um, and that's interesting. There's an old blues song, um, Talking Hard Luck Blues, you know, where uh, that's the ultimate line in the song where he says, you know, uh, I think it starts off where he's saying, you know, I, the, I was born in this county, land so poor, had to pour fertilizer around the telephone poles before he could speak across the wires. And, um, and then he goes on to, you know, say, at the, at the end, he says, I've been balled out, balled up, hung out, hung up, you know, I don't know, a few other things, and doggone nigh murdered. And I'll tell you, the only reason I'm sticking around now, folks, is just to see what in the hell's going to happen next. And if that ain't hard luck, you better tell me what is. So, anyway, that's the song. But, you know, but that idea of sticking around to see what in the hell's going to happen next is kind of, you know, I think that's, that's a good reason to stick around, <laughs> you know. And, um, you know, so I, you know, that's kind of, so that's the kind of point that I like to put my pieces on. I mean, it sort of started as an accident because, um, you know, I, I was trying to build something that would work better than it wound up working. And then I realized that, you know, that, that because it wasn't working so well, I was starting to get an emotional attachment with it. <laughs> that it had this, the, because it was working but not working well, I, my heart was going out to it in a way that wouldn't be true if it worked too well. And wouldn't be true if it didn't work at all, and you know. So I, so the, the so that it occurred to me that I really needed to, no matter if I did get more skillful at building these things, I need to still keep them on that line. I need to move them back to the line of just barely working. So they are, and they break, and then I fix them because I want them to just barely work. So they also have this hodgepodge of band-aid joints on them that have been all these repairs over the years, like sort of you know the scars on a body, if you will. You know, from various surgeries. You know, so. Anyway, I don't know if that answers. Uh, 
That's my all. Yeah. My question would be about um, the relationship between interaction and memory and maybe um, thinking, like the generation of thoughts. So with, mo with almost all of the works you've shown, um, there are pedals, cranks, uh, you have to apply a force so that you get a result. Um, so there's this bodily, bodily involvement um, mm -hmm in the uh, experiencing of the artwork. Do you think this uh, increases uh, the mind share of the artwork in people's minds? Do you think it makes people think more about what it is or what they're doing? Well, I, I, I do think so. I think, but I think that, um, but they also think less about what they're doing <laughs> at the same time. And that in some ways is a, is a blessing. So the, um, so here's a little story about the the, uh, the heart simulation piece. So I made this piece, and yeah, you know, and and it does take at least two people. There's actually a whole clockwork mechanism connected to it that I didn't show you that requires a third person and other parts um, as well. But um, you know, so this was shown at um, you know Yerba Buena Gardens, a pretty big space with uh, with with security guards, and the security guards, of course were thrilled. They loved this. They got to interact with people. They got to talk to people and say, not only can you touch this, but this is a good way to do it. Look at this. It does this. It does that. You know, So they were having a really good time with the piece. And then a memo started circulating towards the end of the show where um, the education department felt that the security guards were overstepping their boundaries by actually telling people what might be appropriate to do. So the security cards were then ordered to no longer touch the pieces, but the public could still touch them. And you know, so I went back, and the security guards are kind of pouting in the corner now. <laughs> and um, so, you know, so 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 here's the thing. I guess the, I'm, yeah, this ex kind of exposes the, you know, how far down the democracy goes in in the culture of this museum. You know, it goes so far down, and then it's, and then you're on another level, the security guard level, where there's no longer democracy. Kind of like the ancient Greeks in democracy, they had slaves. The slaves didn't vote. You know, so. Um, uh, but but aside from that, there was this 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 thing that you know that that, that was happening between the people that were interacting with the pieces, that, that they were not conscious of. And yet there was there were relationships kind of springing up. People would get other people to help them. They would start having conversations with people they didn't know. They would you know they would new groups would start to form. But because the pieces were, were complex and the pieces are interesting and intriguing, and and their main goal when they're there is trying to figure out how to get this to work. What does it do? They're they're not thinking about the interaction that they're having with each other. You know, so in, in a way, they're you know, in a way, they're being less conscious of that, but they're and more conscious of other aspects of the piece, and yet they're both affecting them in some way. You know, they're you know, they're both having some effect, conscious and unconsciously. So, so I you know, I don't know. It, feel, it feels to me like there's an entire arena here that I've just scratched the surface of, that I don't have. You know, I have not really probed this whole arena of uh, of this sort of uh, what do they call it uh, in in psychology? We used to call this unobtrusive measurement, where you would you would basically be distracting somebody by some supposed task that they were doing, but you were really interested in the way they were walking down the hall when they were doing this supposed task or something like that. You were not interested in the uh, in the actual task that you had given them to do, and um, you know so. It seems like you know. It seems like this is a a, a large potential arena the, um, of investigation that you know that I, you know, am, am, am happy to let you know other people in, engage in as well. I mean, it's 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 potentially immense. The other thing about this, which is kind of interesting, is also psycho psychology is the theory of cognitive dissonance, which, as I remember it, is um, it's kind of about you know how. Um, how much work you put into something and what your commitment to it becomes you know so the only way to affect true attitude change you know according to the psychologists is to actually make people work on the opposing idea and if they work on the opposing idea and they actually perform work mental work in my case physical work they're they're going to be they're going to develop a commitment to this other thought 
And uh, otherwise, forget it. You know, people don't change their attitudes. They um, they basically, you know, will, are you know people you know, once they're once they got an attitude, they they have it. You know, and um, you know it's not going to change. All these polls that show undecided voters, it's a lot of crap. Most of them know what they're going to do subconsciously, even if they haven't consciously recognized who they're going to vote for. So you know, um, my father, by the way, was. Um, a voting analyst, you know, early voting analyst. So this was one of his major tenets that, you know, there are no undecided voters. If he talked to someone long enough, he knew who they were going to vote for, even if they didn't. So, um, you know, but this is part of the media game that gets played, you know, that, you know, that, oh, they're 20% still undecided, you know, and we're fighting for their vote, you know, but, you know, anyway. <laughs> so, but, I don't know, that was a really, you know, the word divigation, this is, this is a, it, it, the dictionary says it means meandering, but, but I think it means meandering towards a goal. And this is kind of what I do, you know, when I'm talking and maybe when I'm making art. I'm kind of meandering, but I'm heading somewhere. Sometimes I don't know where it is yet, but as soon as I kind of get sight of it, you know, then I'm, you know, kind of, then I focus more attention on it. So I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Okay, so maybe we could take like one one more question if 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 there are any. If we have one, yeah. Have we have a question right yeah. there? Okay. Do you want to come and take the it's mic? Just, and Jono wants to know why why I turn the volume up. <laughs> I, um, I actually, you were talking about the lightness in especially the death piece with the mm -hmm. coffin, and um, instantly when I saw. You know, the first piece about uh, the heart, mm -hmm. I thought of Rube Goldberg, and I was wondering what that sort of influence played on you, because you talked about a lot of other artists. Oh, yeah, I did talk. I didn't, I should, well, you know, there, there are only so many things one can do in a, more or less an hour. But, but yeah, Rube Goldberg is, um, is definitely, in, in England, his name is Heath Robinson, you know, although he's, you know, He's, you know, a, a different person, but they had the same kind of, um, you know, clever mechanisms to do, you know, like complicated mechanisms to do absurd things. Somewhere on my computer, I've got some Rube Goldberg cartoons, but I don't think I can dig them up fast enough while I'm talking. But Rube Goldberg, if you, you should check him out. He would do these things like, um, like um, how to remember to mail your wife's letter. So Professor Butts was his name. Professor Butts would come up with this device to remember how to mail his wife's letter as he's heading past the mailbox. So as he's walking down the street, you know, you know, he passes this lamppost and the lamppost knocks this bird off the perch. And then when the bird falls off the perch, the cat wakes up and the cat jumps through, you know, towards the bird and that pulls the string. And I can't remember the details, but you know, eventually, you know, it, it yanks up this little sign in front of Professor Butt's face just as he gets to the mailbox saying, mail the letter, stupid, you know. So he puts the letter in the mailbox. So it's it's, he's got contraptions like this, and um, um, there's, a, there's um, you know, basically, you know, his contraptions are kind of, I mean, f they have several qualities. One of them is that, um, that they are, are a complex way of doing something that, that should be terribly simple. And, um, you know, so that's one quality that they have, which I quite like and has influenced me, because, of course, the reason Gol Goldberg and Heath Robinson were so popular is because this resonates with all of us. We all go through life creating these complicated routines out of things that should be so simple. And, and when we go to work, you know, the boss makes us do this stuff, but it's actually really easy. Why do I have to do it this way? You know, so it's, it's something that resonates with us, you know, in our daily lives in so many ways. The other thing about his work is that it's all about chain reactions. It's all about one thing leading inevitably to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing, and yet, you know, the the original premise is absurd. <laughs> it you know it's so you know and this is and this is true in my work and it's also true in the way children play. When children are playing, you know they're um, you know they they get they get into you know like some really absurd idea, but they get really serious about it and they set up these rules. And you cannot violate these rules. You know, one thing has to follow from another thing, and it, and it makes perfect sense that this is leading to that, or you know, um, you know, or you're out of the game. And you know, so um, so I think you know, that in the same way, you know, that that you know, in a way that if you got a bird, you got to have a cat. You know, I mean, there's something inevitable about 
about about this this, this chain that, that Goldberg sets up, that you know that I also like. I like you know. In fact, all my pieces are like the 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 um, the, the conservation of intimacy, for example. You know, I started that piece off. I, I made a bench, put it on springs. The first thing that happened when someone sat on it was it fell over backwards. So I said, okay, I need a spring in the back to catch them when they fall over. So I get this big spring in the back to catch them when they fall over. And I said, now I want to be able to analyze how they're moving. So I'm going to hook up some, some of these pneumatic sensors to them. But, but I couldn't get very many pneumatic sensors around the bottom. So I had to build a huge tower and put these, spring, uh, these strings and springs on it so that I could actually attach the sensors. It was all very logical. You know, I needed a place to put the sensors that wouldn't get interfere with the motion that the people were involved in. So it's the same kind of, you know, like kind of the logic, you know, once you, you start with your absurd premise, but then everything else just follows. And you just keep following it through until you get to the, you know, the wonderfully, hopefully wonderfully absurd ending, you know, that, um, you know, that was obvious all along. And, uh, you know, so, you know, uh, and it's also this this whole is another thing about Goldberg and my pieces is this whole this whole connection to science and the enterprise of science, you know. So I mean, we could go on for another hour. The, but the, in the enterprise of science, you know, you've you know you you you've the, uh, there's a cartoon which I also have on here somewhere, but I I I won't be able to find it. It's uh it was a Far Side cartoon, and uh, he's got a couple of guys in white lab coats and they're standing in front of a blackboard, and on the blackboard. One of them is written, um, you know, something like, you know, 4w you know, times 3r minus 6w squared, you know, square root of, divided by the square root of whatever. I can't remember it exactly. But all these w's and r's, and, his, and, 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 and the guy who's written this has turned to his comrade and he says, I know that, Sydney. Everybody knows that. But I think you will agree that if you take four wrongs to the 15th power and divide them by the square root of this formula, you do get a right. And this kind of this is kind of the scientific enterprise, you know. I mean, it's if you take all those wrongs and you divide it by the, the you know, so it's kind of this absurd gesture, and yet, you know, things come out of it that are totally unexpected and 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 are resonantly true. So, um, so you know, so Goldberg and myself, we have this. I think you know, we have this this reverence for the enterprise of science and this recognition of the absurdity of the entire endeavor at the same time. So here I am analyzing intimacy. You know, but in fact, and I thought, I, okay, I'm going to make this joke of these pens writing on the on the wall. But you know, but I didn't just make it a joke. I set one pen up for the up down, one pen for the left right, one pen for the forward back. And sure enough, if you look at the chart, you can tell what someone's doing on the bench. You know, you actually know whether the couple is working together, whether they're fighting with each other. You can actually tell a lot from reading this chart. And although I was doing it just as kind of like a little satire on the scientific enterprise, it turns out to actually not be a bad measure of what's going on. So you do get a right. <laughs> okay, so it's almost 8 o'clock. Let me just uh, finish by uh, evoking uh, my, uh, my first vision of uh, when I went to visit Bernie uh, in San Francisco at this place some years ago. And... Uh, so Bernie spoke about the speech etiology of innocence, the heart piece here. And the, the, my, the first time I saw the heart piece, actually, this, this huge work, it was actually installed inside Bernie's apartment, basically taking over practically the whole apartment so that it was even difficult to get from one room to another. So, and I think this is something about dedication to one's, one's work. So I think with this, uh, I would like to th thank Bernie Wall. I was looking to see if I, okay. I have some pictures of that somewhere. I thought I could find them, but I, I'm not sure. Uh -huh. that, I okay, think yeah, I was, it, was, it was quite a sight, I must yeah. say, you know. But anyway, so. And, and not only that, he actually broke the piece in about five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well. He succeeded in breaking the handle off, and, and, I, and I think it was just very mortifying that he'd done this. And I, and I sorry about that. So I, I'm telling you, oh no, this is great, Erky, because now I know the, I'm one of the weak points. I need to get it just a little bit stronger. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, Since that time, it has had a very good um, kind of career in, in all these exhibitions. And I think, you know, so I think this is called testing, isn't it? So, 
Anyway, so, all right, so Bernie, thank you very much for your wonderful talk. Yeah.